Hi there. It's an honor to be here. Uh, that was a fascinating talk from Peter. I'm going to agree on some things and disagree on another. I am going to talk about the disruption that I see coming to the $6 trillion spent in the energy industry today, which is primarily overwhelmingly fossil fuels. I'm a clean energy investor. I've been in it for, let's say, uh, five or six years investing, nine or ten years doing forecasting in this industry. I occasionally invest in other things, but mostly clean energy. I lead syndicates. If you're interested, let me know. I'm going to tell you what I look for if you're a startup founder here. And the reason that I invest in, in clean tech is uh, both economic and moral. We have 1.4 billion people on planet Earth that don't have electricity. That's a moral failing. We're in the 21st century age of abundance. We've got a space track here, a quantum track here. We don't have electricity for all of our people. And then we have 5 million people die every year from air pollution, which mostly comes from combustion. Half of that's wood, and half it's combustion of, of coal and oil, basically. And then we have climate change, which really is a, a very large systemic issue. I'm not a climate doomer. We can survive at 2 degrees Celsius. It'll suck, but we can survive. Uh, but it's not good. It's a very, very large systemic problem. That said, I believe disruption is coming, and it's coming in part because of uh, a chart like what Peter showed. I'm not sure if my clicker is working. Let's try some more. Get closer. Closer. Uh, hit one more time, please. Uh, it's this chart. This is uh, from Irina, the cost decline of all so two sorts, really, solar and wind uh, of two varieties each over just the last decade. And you see that green band, the fossil fuel cost range. And up until, let's say, 2014, 15, all clean energy around the world almost had to be subsidized. We were in phase one. And we've entered phase two, where in places that have good wind and good sun, solar and wind are now competing uh, directly on their own merits if there's an open market. So let's talk about that. Here's wind power prices. And this is, again, from Irina. That red dashed line is the cost of new coal or gas generation, about the cheapest you can get it. And what you see is, basically, everywhere around the world, the price is dropping. And for the most part, before about 2014, there was no place on Earth that you could deploy wind power just based on market economics. It had to be subsidized. And in fact, Europe spent a couple hundred billion euros subsidizing clean energy starting back in the 2000s. Uh, and as Peter said, we're the beneficiaries of that. That scaled it and brought it down in cost. And I'll talk about that more, in fact, right here. Everyone here knows Moore's Law, right? Raise your hand if you know Moore's Law. Raise your hand if you don't know Moore's Law. All right, thank goodness. Uh, you're a better audience than most. There's something more fundamental than Moore's Law. It's called Wright's Law. And Wright's Law was discovered in World War II when we studied the uh, assembly and production costs of military aircraft. And we found every doubling of scale brought down the cost by a fixed percentage. And in fact, in basically every human industrial process, and certainly every manufacturing process, you find this. Every doubling of scale brings down the cost by a fixed percentage. In wind, every doubling of scale has historically brought down the cost by about 19%. It's not a smooth line, but that's more or less what we get. So that means there's this relationship. In fact, this applies for any new tech that any of you are working on. When you first start uh, using a new technology, it's super expensive. And what you have to do as an entrepreneur or a business is find some initial market for that tech that is willing to pay that price, whether it's because of subsidies or with solar panels. It was for satellites, right? And that first market gives you uh, more demand. Your scale goes up. And as the industry scales, the prices come down. And then if you're lucky, the prices have dropped to where there's another market that can uh, where it's worth for, for them to adopt your product. So think about this as you're being an entrepreneur. And now the future of wind, as was alluded to earlier, really is offshore. And that's a crazy thing. I'm one of the biggest optimists on clean tech on planet Earth. And I will tell you, in 2017, I sat around in Germany with a utility there, and we all agreed that offshore wind would never be price competitive with onshore. It's too bad, because the best winds on Earth the steadiest and fastest aren't on land, they're offshore. But we thought the construction costs are too high, yada, 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 yada. And we were all wrong. Because in 2017, we had three bids in the North Sea for offshore wind completely unsubsidized. The price of offshore wind bids in markets has dropped by a factor of three in the last seven years. And now it looks like offshore wind will be cheaper than onshore in many parts 
of the world. And floating wind comes beyond that, but we're not going to talk, talk about that today. But solar makes wind look slow and stagnant. This is the cost of solar panels per watt. That learning curve uh, isn't just a new phenomenon. That learning curve has been going on since the 70s. 1977, one watt of solar panel cost you 77 bucks. Now the average price in the US, if you ignore the tariffs, 22 cents, right? 350 times price reduction just to the panels. Whole electricity cost has more in it than just the panel cost, of course. Uh, but this is, this is physical infrastructure. This is the master resource, right, that powers everything. And it's dropping almost like digital. Not like digital. Digital is 10 million times in this time frame. But there's no other physical uh, resource that has seen a price decline like this. So now we have crossover, uh, where in the sunny parts of the world, solar is the cheapest energy you can buy, unsubsidized and is dropping in price faster than any other. So we've got to beat about this number, six cents a kilowatt hour, maybe five in some very good markets, is what it costs for new generation uh, from coal or uh, gas. In fact, in Europe, it's more like nine or 10 cents. So we're seeing that India, uh, coal peaked, coal consumption around the world peaked in 2013, as Peter has shown. It's been on an undulating, undulating plateau since then. It's risen the last couple of years, still not at its peak. But India is where people thought coal consumption would keep rising after China applied breaks. But we've seen Indian solar bids uh, at less than four cents now. And the price of solar in India dropped by a factor of four in a four-year period. In the US, the 20-year contract price for solar dropped by a factor of 10 in the last 10 years. The cheapest bid now is in Idaho, not even that sunny a place. If you remove all subsidies, it was about 3.1 cents. It's about half the price of new coal, about 60% uh, the price of new natural gas. Uh, I love this picture. I'm in uh, uh, the UAE here. They've got multiple bids in an oil capital of, you know, two and a half cents or less. In Latin America, we've got incredible bids. Chile, two cents. Mexico, two cents. Brazil, 2.5 cents. So we are just seeing this incredible plunge in price. Solar started off at a higher price. Uh, than wind, uh, so it's had further to fall, uh, but it has been falling at just a totally phenomenal pace, and now it's entered that second phase, that competitive phase, just since about 2015. So now, where is new solar cheaper than new fossil electricity? Roughly these places. If you can get a decent cost of capital, in some of the developing world, the borrowing costs are too high, uh, but that's more or less what it looks like right now. And of course, solar has a learning rate too. It's faster than wind. Uh, it's about 30% per doubling. That means that it is now uh, in a neutral policy environment. If you took away all solar subsidies and all pro-solar policies, solar would naturally grow to be cheaper than new solar, cheaper than new fossil generation in almost all of the world, including large parts uh, of Canada. Now, I want to say this. Solar and wind are largely countercyclical. The wind peaks in winter. The sun peaks in summer. Uh, the sun is only during the day. If you see sun at night, please call a doctor. You might need some help. And the wind statistically blows more at night. So most models show if you build a continent-sized grid, which we haven't really done, you can get 70% of, and you use software controls, which is very important, you can get maybe 70% of your electricity from solar and wind, not even counting hydro, nuclear, et cetera, uh, and not even counting storage. But storage is now the most exciting uh, technical domain and most exciting investment opportunity, perhaps, at least in hard tech, uh, in uh, clean energy. And that's because storage is also going through an incredible price decline. Between 2010 and 2018, the price of lithium ion batteries dropped 85%, right? The learning rate is more or less the same as solar, or somewhere between 25% and 30% uh, per doubling. And that means, so batteries are actually still incredibly expensive. It's maybe 15 cents to round trip a kilowatt hour into a battery and back out. It's more expensive uh, than coal or gas. But wholesale markets actually have this fluctuation behind the scenes. And so this remarkable thing happened last year. In Arizona, a utility owned by Warren Buffett put out a solicitation for electricity between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. And 
historically only one technology would ever win that auction, it would be natural gas. Natural gas power generation is much more flexible than coal, and natural gas in the U.S. is quite cheap, but first solar won that with batteries hooked up to a solar plant. Now they had a 30% investment tax credit that helped them, uh, but 30% is about what the price of batteries drops every two years, right? So even as those subsidies phase out, the prices will keep uh, dropping. And storage is even more disruptive at the edge of the network because retail electricity prices are much higher than wholesale electricity prices. So at your home or a commercial building, you're dealing with retail, and the world is moving more and more to time of use pricing. So at the most uh, highest demand hours, the price is highest. So here's, this is San Diego. There's a more than 30 cent uh, differentiation between the price at midnight and the price in the late afternoon. So a battery is now cheap enough to arbitrage that uh, if you get a decent cost of capital or you sell it as a, uh, provided as a service, which uh, Sunrun now does. They just put a battery in your home for free and you pay monthly, but you actually save money, right? And uh, batteries will keep dropping in price. Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is pretty good, says a 3x reduction over the next uh, decade. I say 5x. I'll tell you a secret about our track records for BNEF and me. Historically, we've both been conservative. We've both been too slow in our forecasts basically every time. So that's, but that's, but 5x gets close to the cost. It's like 5x, you're about twice the cost of raw materials for lithium ion battery. So we're approaching about the floor that you can get there. But fortunately, there's a huge variety of other batteries uh, coming down the pipe. And I think we're going to see a bifurcation, one direction for mobility, another direction for stationary storage. For mobility, you see things like with the first uh, battery unicorn, Sila put silicon in the negative electrode of a battery. They just raised a bunch of money from Daimler, and they're now valued at over a billion. Uh, and in the other direction, sort of my portfolio companies, I actually, hard tech terrifies me, uh, but I couldn't resist these guys. Your lithium ion battery, if you drain it all the way down to zero a few hundred times, it gets seriously degraded. This battery you can drain 20,000 times to zero with zero, no degradation whatsoever. So its lifetime cost is probably already in the five or six cents per kilowatt hour range. Now, uh, the physician who spoke earlier, who I loved, uh, talked about the six Ds at Singularity. This is a deceptive domain. Let me show you. Here's the IEA. Peter showed you some IEA forecasts. The IEA are absolutely the world's experts on energy. They are not what I would call a disruptive organization, right? And let me show you. Here's IEA forecasts for the growth of solar versus what has actually happened. The left side is uh, what actually happened in annual installations, and the right side are successive years of IEA forecasts, right? It's like some analyst is looking at their last year's forecast in Excel and hitting control C, control V, right? That's not a methodology, well, it is a methodology, it's not a good methodology. So for me, it's trust the, the innovators more than the, the forecasters, <clears throat> and here's why they miss because they don't understand the learning curve. Peter understands it, the IEA doesn't, and this is the US EIA actually. Here's their forecast for the cost of solar, and they just kind of say a couple percent reduction per year, and here's what's actually been happening. Or here's my favorite, uh, here's a battery price forecast uh, from 2013. Here's the US EIA. Those red and blue lines, by the way, are massive optimists. Uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Navigant, they're like uh, considered sort of by the energy industry crazy bullish optimists. Here's what actually happened, all right? Bet on the innovators and bet on the learning curve more than anything else. So that means we're entering a third phase, the disruptive phase. I told you about phases one and two. Phase one, energy, clean energy was policy dependent. It had to be subsidized. Phase two, we just barely entered recently where it was competitive for new power. Phase three is where building new clean energy is cheaper than operating an existing fossil resource. And it's insane to talk about that as a possibility, and yet it's happening. This happened in October. <clears throat> Indian utility, NIPSCO, Northern Indiana, red state, voted for Trump by 19 points, 65% coal powered today. Uh, average sun, uh, above average but not great wind, said it would save their customers $4 billion to basically phase out all that coal phase out the bulk of it by 2023, and then all the rest by 2028. And they didn't even say they would add any new natural gas. In their cost estimate, it was cheaper to add new solar, wind, batteries, and flexible demand, software controlled, uh, than it was to add any other 
resource. Carbon Tracker, a think tank, uh, made this analysis. Here's coal OPEX in the US rising as the plants age. Here's the cost of new solar, early 2020s. Uh, but of course, it matters beyond just the US. China, biggest energy consumer in the world. Here's uh, Carbon Tracker again, coal OPEX rising, both because of aging plants and because of pollution controls. Cost of new wind, cost of new solar. Maybe you don't trust Carbon Tracker. Here's McKinsey. This is a complicated chart, but it's when will new solar or new wind be cheaper than the OPEX of existing coal or gas? Basically, everywhere on Earth by 2030, or pretty close to that. Now, they could be wrong, but again, the history is of forecasters mostly being too conservative about how fast things go. So I see a massive disruption happening. Uh, I see coal being on that undulating plateau, maybe hitting a new peak in the next couple of years, and then in the second half of the next decade, uh, plunging quite rapidly because capital chases growth, and when it's cheaper to build a new thing than, it, than to keep the old thing running, I think we'll see more capital get unlocked. But I promise you we'll talk about energy, and I've only talked about electricity. So let's talk about oil. Uh, as Peter said, we, we used to talk about peak oil supply, and that didn't happen. High prices create incentives for exploration and innovation. What we should be talking about is peak oil demand, and I'm not the first person or the hundredth to talk about that. The first was Sheikh Ahmed Yamani, who was the Saudi oil minister in the 70s during the OPEC crisis. And in 2000, he said this to his fellow sheikhs. He said, the stone age didn't end for a lack of stone. Right? He said the world invented better technology, and it's going to happen here. Now, he thought it was biofuels, actually. He was ahead of his time, and he was wrong on what the tech is. But it's happening right now. It's happening in part because of uh, EVs. EVs are still a tiny fraction. Uh, Tesla, you know, is at an inflection point. They could fail. They could succeed. It doesn't matter anymore what happens to Tesla. I mean, I hope they succeed. But the, every auto OEM now is going after this. The auto OEMs, when you add Toyota, who just announced this, have 300 billion committed for new EVs over the next handful of years. And EVs are growing exponentially, 64% growth last year. Now, there's still only half a percent of cars on the road and only 3% of new car sales. In China, they're probably 10% of new car sales. In California, they're 8%. But that exponential growth plus a cyclical phenomenon in uh, automotive has caused something to happen that no one expected to happen this soon. We hit the peak of internal combustion engine sales, probably in 2017. Cyclical downturn in car sales and EVs taking all of the growth, right? That's a peak demand that's happening. But beyond that, well, and, and of course the forecasters, it looks just like solar. These are three years of successive forecasts from different forecasters. And you see basically every year, every forecaster, including the optimists, lifts their forecasts. But there's something more fundamental. So it's not one tech that's going to make this change. It's the combination of three things. Electrification plus autonomy as a service. This is the future of mobility. UBS, this is a $2 trillion opportunity. Autonomy, I can't tell you exactly when it's going to happen, but it's happening. These are videos from Zooks, which is probably the number four player uh, in the world. Uh, and even these are really quite impressive. Uh, but the leaders are probably Waymo, uh, Google's company, uh, who has their service in beta, uh, and Cruise, owned by GM. They're all having some degree of problems. But we can measure their performance because of a metric called autonomous miles driven per human intervention, right? And what we see is Waymo is now driving in 2018 11,000 autonomous miles per time that the safety driver has to intervene, right? And that's a 6x fold increase. So there's a lot happening there. It's getting better and better. And Tesla is probably the wild card coming in it with a different direction. Why does that matter? Well, it disrupts a lot of things. This is a $2, billion, $2 trillion real estate disruption. Uh, it's a disruption of radio, a lot of things. Uh, but it does something tremendous to transport as a service. It cuts the cost of your Uber ride in half. All right, why does that affect oil? Because electric vehicles are the cheapest vehicles on a per mile basis. And here's why. This is the entire engine and drivetrain of an EV. This is an internal combustion engine vehicle, right? That means EVs get uh, five times the range per dollar spent on energy. They have one quarter the maintenance costs per year. And if you add that up, 
Here is the total cost of ownership of an internal combustion engine vehicle. Vehicle's cheap, fuel's expensive, and here's an EV. The vehicle's more expensive right now, but the cost of energy and maintenance means that it's already cheaper on a per mile basis, right? And as they continue to scale and hit their own learning curves, it's gonna be by 2030 half the price per mile. So you're talking about uh, an autonomous electric taxi having a cost per mile that's less than half the cost of owning a Prius, right? And a fifth or a quarter of the cost of riding in an Uber now. And that's for a four passenger vehicle. I think we'll see a Cambrian explosion of different vehicle form factors. And some of these form factors will lead to costs that are, you know, 10 to 20 cents a mile. And then you'll still own your internal combustion vehicle, but it'll sit in your driveway or your garage. All right, what does this mean for startups? Well, first, let me just say, as Peter pointed out, solar is 2%, uh, electricity is, or wind is 6%, EVs are half a percent, right? Huge headroom, and we're still not at our peak of carbon emissions. We have to go faster and faster, and there's problems I haven't even mentioned here. Agriculture and land use is a quarter of our carbon emissions. Uh, manufacturing is 22%. There's opportunities across the board. Here's what I look for as an early stage investor. The best performing category of clean tech is the first one. It's companies that look like tech companies, software, IoT, network effects, zero marginal cost. Second is really finance plays. Take something that would be big CapEx, make it a service that cuts costs for the company. Third, worst performing, but most important, is hard tech. Better batteries, better solar, better geothermal. But if you're doing that, you better be seven or 10 years ahead of those cost curves if you want to survive and if you want me to invest, okay? And I'm just gonna double down on that second one. Find the gap for the customer. What drove deployment of rooftop solar in the US? It was really three things. It was policy, it was technology, and it was a change to the business model. The tech I've talked about, prices came down, though really policy catalyzed that. Policy, subsidies, net metering, feed-in tariffs. But this is what unlocked it. This is a company, you all heard this is Solar City. They really came to the customer and said, instead of spending $25,000 to get solar on your roof, we're gonna give it to you as a service. And it's gonna save you money from day one. So whatever your job is in this room, if you're not a chemist or a physicist, if you have the right business model innovation, you can tap into this market. Thank you all very much.